Well, I guess I'm stuck. <laughs> so uh, I switched the title of my lecture. I gave Becky and Molly a different title, but I was thinking that um, last year, almost at the end of the last academic year, Dr. Cavallasi gave a very good lecture about COPD and the updates of COPD and the indications for the pneumonia shots and the flu shots and the new uh, COPD interventions. So I switched it a little bit. Um, so this is something that I commonly see in my clinic. This is for me very hard to deal with when I have a patient with frequent exacerbations and frequent exacer COPD exacerbation defined as more than two over the last over a year or the last 12 months before you see the patient. <clears throat> so um, I'm gonna um, focus on that today. So this has nothing to do with the lecture, but I was debating whether or not to give a COPD lecture or a teaching lecture. So um, ever since I started being the Association Program Director, I've been interested in teaching and education specifically for adult physicians. So um, I, did a, I went to a workshop and they showed me this picture <coughs> about lecture. This is basically a, a portrait of how old times they used to give lectures and um, the ones that have sat with me in the program evaluation committee, we discussed a lot that lectures are outdated. Um, and because it used to be the speaker reading from a book which can be very boring, and of course, in the front, the one's paying attention, and then you lose attention in the back. Um, so um, I've thought a, a lot about it, a lot on the feedback that um, all of you give me specifically. And I think lectures still work, but it has to be both ways, so it has to be an active speaker, but also an active learner. Um, so for today, we're gonna try a couple things different. So I've noticed that um, I lose attention from the fellows after 10 minutes, 15 minutes. So I'm gonna stop within every 10 minutes or 15 minutes to discuss a case. And um, no turning point. So I want this to be active. There are not gonna be any wrong answers. You'll see what I mean. And also, I thought about this picture because you have your speaker, right? And then the ones in the front. I always think of Guardiola, who's always <laughs> taking notes. Always taking notes. And then I always think of Kareem because he sits right next to the door because he has 100 clinics, so he usually has to leave early. And then, of course, somebody's sleeping, I'm not gonna say who this reminds me of, but this could be me if Emma hasn't slept the night before. And of course, the one texting, this dude was probably texting, so uh, I'm pretty sure that he was the same. So, with that said, uh, because we're recording this some disclosures, I'm doing pharmaceutical company trials, I'm gonna talk about some of the products, but it's not gonna affect the presentation. So we're gonna talk about COPD very briefly. So I'm gonna focus mostly about COPD exacerbations. As I said before, we had a couple of lectures about COPD and the treatment um, last year. Um, I'm gonna talk about the causes and the cause of uh, exacerbations and then evidence-based interventions that have been known to reduce COPD exacerbation. And I'm gonna show the evidence of that. What are the preventive measures, not necessarily medical. And then we're gonna talk about predictors of frequent exacerbation, some within that group, C and D of goals classification. Which of those, what traits are the patients have within those groups that can help us predict which ones are gonna have a lot of exacerbations. So you know this, COPD, preventable, disease that can have extra pulmonary manifestations, specifically heart disease, physical deconditioning, malnutrition, airway limitation that is not fully reversible, key concept when distinguishing between COPD and asthma, and this airflow limitation is progressive, specifically if the patient keeps smoking, but also if you keep in mind that if a patient has frequent exacerbation, the disease, um, the natural history of the disease can decline very quickly. And this airflow limitation is associated with an inflammatory response that is gonna be helpful to determine the different kinds of phenotypes within the COPD group. Um, very simplistic way of looking at it, two parallel pathways, so there's an inflammation that is usually triggered by smoking. You have a small airway problem, airway inflammation, airway remodeling, but also at a parenchymal level, you have parenchymal destruction, loss of the alveoli, and decrease of the elastic recoil. This leads to chronic um, irreversible airflow limitation, air trapping, dynamic air trapping, and consequently, the shortness of breath. Um, very simple way of looking at the management of COPD, but it's a good reminder. So you have from the clinical presentation spectrum at risk, which is basically constitute what was known as gold stage zero. So patients without obstruction of PFT, but risk factors, smoking and symptoms, chronic cough, sputum production. 
patients are symptomatic, and then progressing to exacerbations and respiratory failure. And then the intervention, smoking cessation is important for all groups. Disease management, here is where you um, start with the inhalers, pulmonary rehab, the nutrition. Pulmonary rehab, uh, as you can see, is indicated for patients that are symptomatic. Also patients with exacerbations are in the hospital. And there are other options, and when we talk about um, and COPD exacerbations, I'm going to talk about the other options. And you can see the history and disease progression as FE1 declines, symptoms increase. So this was published in 2004 in the American Thoracic Society Journal. It's a pretty good way to looking at the, the treatment of COPD. So <clears throat> what is a COPD exacerbation? Can you, can you guys tell me what is a COPD exacerbation? What are some features, two features? You can tell them out loud. Okay, everyone said that at the same time. Interesting. What's that? What else? Increase of charge of breath from basement. Good. Yeah. So the definition it's um, and I hate to put busy slides, but it's actually a copy paste from the European Respiratory Journal. So I'm going to read it. So an event that in the natural course of the disease characterized by a baseline change in patients dyspnea, cough, and or sputum that is beyond the normal day-to-day -day variations is acutely onset and may warrant a change in regular medication in a patient with underlying COPD. It kind of needs a period somewhere, right? So what do you think about that? It's not everything that you said, but it's not very objective. So you're, de you're depending a lot on what the patient is telling you. And that can vary from patient to patient, okay? So, but this is the actual definition for um, COPD exacerbation. And why is it important to know? So this is from the CDC. So this is uh, the data from 2009. So it, there were 8 million visits, office visits, 1.5 million ER visits, 715,000 hospitalizations, 133,000 deaths. That's pretty high. And also the cause, this is in 2010. This was the most recent data that I can find yesterday. So uh, $29.9 billion. So that's this how that $49 billion is distributed. So 30 billion is basically on direct healthcare related to COPD. And that's not necessarily hospitalization, but the treatment of COPD itself. So it costs a lot of money. That's why there's a lot of investment too in clinical trials too. <clears throat> so, You've seen this slide before. So this also to make another point. This is an old study, 77. I think on all my smoking related diseases, I have this slide. So this is the progression of the, the lung um, function on a patient that never smoked. This is a decline. A patient that smoked and never quit, quit. This is a steep decline. But even on a patient that quit on an early age, the decline is more significant than somebody that never smoked. And here is a patient that quit smoking at 65. So even if a patient that smoked for a brief period of time, the decline is more significant than no one smoked. Imagine this to somebody that keeps having frequent exacerbations. It's going to be more significant. The, the survival is going to be less, shorter. <coughs> so that these are the causes don't, for. Don't click that. So these are the causes of COPD, pre evenly this of COPD exacerbation pre evenly distributed. So you have the non-infectious. I get a lot of these in my clinic. So either a patient that doesn't know how to use the inhaler or used to be on a Simba cord and now the insurance is, pay, you need to pay a $200, $300 copay. I get a lot of non-infectious um, causes of COPD exacerbation, but you always think of the infectious and also the mixed bacterial and viral infection. And that's why we all, most of the time empirically, we start treating patients with antibiotics when they present with a COPD <laughs> exacerbation. In addition to um, not only the causes of COPD exacerbation, then, then once we diagnose it, then we determine the severity. Can you guys tell me the difference between them? So which one is mild? You don't need steroids. Treated outpatient, you don't need steroids. Okay. Which one is moderate? You need steroids. And which one is severe? Uh, right. So it's as simple as that. So I put it here based on outcome, but this is more physician outcome. So a mild COPD exacerbation, if, it's a pro if the physician feels that can treat you as an outpatient and only doing short acting scheduled bed agonists, that's considered mild. Um, this is actually coming from uh, um, the guidelines that were published last year in the, on the ATS. 
Moderate is, as Alessandra was saying, a patient that you feel that is sick enough that needs to get a steroid and or antibiotics and can be treated outpatient and severe, a patient that gets hospitalized. <clears throat> and then the treatment, um, this is not what I want to talk about today, but this is more or less the overview of the treatment of a COPD exacerbation. So we know that we treat plus minus antibiotics if we feel like there is an infection. Um, also, we start acetromycin because of the anti-inflammatory effects. Of course, steroids, there's always, you guys know this, I've rotated with all of you in the hospital. So there's always this, we always discuss IV versus oral steroids, um, seven days, 14 days, longer than that. So the evidence for the IV oral is about equivalent. There's some study that patient with severe COPD exacerbation may benefit from IV steroids, um, but those are small studies. Um, the duration, there's no difference. Now, with that said, you've seen all of us do long steroids, long weaning, a week, two weeks. It makes you wonder if there's something else overlapping with COPD, for example, asthma. Scheduled short-acting beta agonists, oxygen, non-invasive, very important. And if non-invasive doesn't work or if there's a contraindication for non-invasive, mechanical ventilation. So I'm, I'm using COPD here for, for Dr. Pettis here because he made a comment about using COPD here, uh, not him, that somebody didn't like using COPD here, so I'm using the COPD here concept. So um, this is something that um, I think one of the faculty brought up, and which is true, that we feel like, we, I think the training of the fellows mostly, we focus on what happens inpatient, but we don't talk a lot what happens outpatient or what should happen outpatient. So this is one of the first cases, so a 52-year-old woman with COPD stage two, these are all real cases by the way, admitted with severe COPD, um, exacerbation, was treated with seven days of prednisone and levaquin, and then was referred for outpatient pulmonary rehab. Now the question for you guys is, when should the follow-up be? So you're discharging the patient, you're debating he needs to see Dr. Kawalasi in? Seven days. Two Okay. And what are we supposed to do in two weeks? Or four weeks or one week? What's that? Okay. That's how would you do that other than symptoms like asking what the strokes of breath this man hypoxia has improved. Okay, good. So, um, and after that, when are you going to see the patient again? <laughs> Six months if your clinic is very busy, like ours. Uh, so this is actually from goal stage. It's almost at the end. Um, it's longer than this. I just put in a couple of important things. So the first follow-up should be, you all said, about the same one to four weeks. Um, important to document the CAT and or MMRC Disney scale. He, um, Bilal mentioned the oxygen, so if the patient went home on oxygen, maybe we assess it. Um, or if the patient's still dyspneic, uh, reassess if they need oxygen now. Um, remember this more for practice. In our clinic here at ACOC, it's two ways of ordering it. Six minute walk is for distance. Multipulse oxygen titration is for oxygen. I know it's kind of but it's two different things, okay? Um, inhaler technique, review inhaler technique. I have a bunch of inhalers in clinic in 690. If you're doing clinic downstairs, I don't think they have inhalers there. Doesn't take, it takes five minutes. Um, I do it with everyone, even patients that have been on inhalers for a long time. And more because they're, we're doing a lot of the ellipta inhalers now and the patients don't know how to use them. So I have all those inhalers. Assess comorbidities. Um, I have Hala this uh, this second half of the year, and she's reminding me how to assess for sleep apnea. I've been burned so many times of not assessing for sleep apnea, and I have patients with bad um, shortness of breath, and, and they end up having um, obstructive sleep apnea. And then after 12 to 16 weeks, you get another follow-up. You do the same thing, but then this time you can get a spirometry or lung or PFTs. Um, I usually, this correlates with the recovery of usually a COPD exacerbation. I tell my patients, it may take you three months for you to fully feel back the way you were before, um, or three months for you to find your new baseline. So the follow-up should not be two weeks, see you in six months. It should be more um, because of what uh, COPD um, carries after you treat it. So, Hiram, a very important measure, certainly for, for 
for those of us administering hospital is the readmission rates. So CHF is probably the worst. COPD is not far behind in terms of readmission. So you need to see them to avoid readmission too. Mm -hmm. So that one to four week is about it's about right, but it's going to be individualized. If you had someone right. with frequent readmissions, you want to see them much earlier. Uh, that's just an important thing. And, and, and along those notes, Gold, um, I don't remember if it was Gold or the APS statement, they talk about telehealth or contacting mm -hmm. the patient. It's weak evidence. You can still do it, call the patient, but it's not a strong evidence as far as the guidelines, but you can do it. So this is my second COPD here. You've probably seen this patient before. So 73-year-old woman, COPD stage three, group D, two years continuously has stage four cervical cancer, um, bone meds, no lung meds. Um, it's on uh, flow vent twice a day, um, fluticasone is an inhaled corticosteroid. Um, she has been treated probably in a year, seven times with antibiotics and steroids. Um, symptoms subjectively, more cough, more shortness of breath. Objectively, um, there was only once that she was more hypoxic. Um, so knowing what I just said, what things can you do for this patient to reduce or prevent future COPD exacerbations with the history that I just gave? This x-ray, a little bit of, see she has some bivasilar um, um, changes. She has some atelectasis, but nothing major. This is not a good, I, I don't think he copy pasted very well. So what other interventions can you do? Again, there's no wrong answer, so you can throw out anything. Good, okay. So what, what's wrong with the inhaler regimen? Is that great, right? For a COPD patient on the inhaled corticosteroids, what else? What's that? She get pneumonia because of the ICS. Yeah, okay. And then the frequency of her uh, rescue inhaler, her nebulizer isn't I don't see listed anything that she takes on top of the... Oh, yeah, she was using it every six hours. Oh, she was, yeah. Yeah. And the technique with that. Yeah, so that's the point of this case. So is the inhaler regimen is not great. So in this scenario, this patient, she has something else that I'm going to talk about in the end, but um, she has not tolerated an anticholinergic medication in the past. Um, I even tried in clinic to see how she did. Um, she started coughing, even with the um, Spreva uh, and the res Spreva recipe mat, and she gets very jittery with long acting bed agonists. Yes. No, I don't know. No, go ahead. I was going to ask about uh, like uh, Reflumalast. She's she's not on it um, because of the side effects. So everything has, was related to side effects. Everything was related to side effects. <laughs> so um, in this case. It's basically there are other things that you can do as far as inhaler inhaler medications, and you this also do an action plan as well. Yeah, action plan. and I'm going to talk about that too. So um, <coughs> what we know, and this is bear with me for a second. I hopefully I'm not going to take a lot of time, but I put this because when we used to sit down and do board reviews, this came up several times about when to start a LABA, a LAMA, an inhaled corticosteroid. This is associated only to exacerbations, okay? So I'm gonna go over some studies. So this was the Uplift 2008. Most of you should know about this. So basically they looked at daily spiriva or teotropium over four, four years um, compared to placebo. And then the inclusion criteria was patient with COPD, more than 40, 10, more than 10 packs um, history, and if you want less than 70. Now this is important, this is the exclusion criteria that they had for this study, so no, um, they would not include patients with um, resection, we're using oxygen for more than 12 hours, recent infection or a COPD exacerbation. And their outcomes was, they were looking at changes in FE1. So in this study there was no change in FE1, however, in the group with teotropium, the St. George questionnaire was lower, meaning that they had a better health. Um, that we, there was a reduction risk of exacerbation and a reduction of respiratory failure. Now this is teotropium compared to placebo. So the torch is comparing salmeterol, which is a long-acting bed agonist, with inhaled corticosteroid and a placebo, either alone or in combination. That makes sense? So salmeterol alone, inhaled corticosteroid, Salmeterol and inhaled corticosteroid and placebo. So there were three groups, uh, actually four. The inclusion were very similar. Um, the primary endpoint, time of tooth death, and as you know, 
inhalers and not be joined to change mortality. But in this case, the group that had the combination therapy of, of inhaled corticosteroids and long acting beta agonists had less exacerbation, had less use of systemic steroids. But the two groups that had steroids had higher incidence of pneumonias, and you guys know that. Inhaled corticosteroid with association with pneumonias. And then POET 2011, um, I was, um, there was a big one as far as the Spreeva use. So this compared teotropium with long acting beta agonists on that all. So I, this was looking at the risk of exacerbations with patients with moderate to, um, it's actually severe, um, COPD. Um, the patient receives spread seotropium daily and some metal or some metal twice a day for one year. And the group on the teotropium had more time for the first exacerbation, so it was 42 days. 11% um, reduction in exacerbation and 18% reduction of use of steroids. So this is why usually all of us start on long-acting muscarinic agent, specifically teotropium, because of the reduction of um, COPD exacerbations. And then <coughs> these are, there's several studies actually about um, acetromycin, this is one of them, this was published in New England, looking at what is the rate of exacerbations in patients taking acetromycin, 250 milligram daily versus placebo. Um, again, the primary endpoint was COPD exacerbation and then they had secondary outcomes. So the group that was taking um, acetromycin for one year, they had um, less exacerbations than the group that was um, in, in the placebo group. Um, increased colonization with microlite resistant organisms, so you guys have to know about that. Um, the gold guidelines from 2017 recommend 250 acetromycin for patients of more, uh, more than um, two exacerbations a year. Um, 250 milligrams if you're gonna do it daily, 500 milligrams if you're gonna do it three times a week. Um, if you guys prescribe that, you're responsible for measuring QT. So that's very important. So get a AKG baseline and when you follow up, you're responsible for that. Um, and then it was associated with improve, um, improvement of quality of life measures. In the study, they excluded QTC about 450? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the other thing about um, the acetromycin is um, this study was done in a year. So you don't know, you don't know how, what are the effects after one year. And then last. so this is, uh, study was published in 20, uh, 2005. They were looking at comparing rofumilast with placebo, 250 um, dose and 500 dose. So the patients on a higher dose of rofumilast had less amount, moderate and severe COPD exacerbations. So um, the recommendation is for patients that have severe, um, more than two exacerbations or one that has uh, that is severe or that require hospitalization, that you can use rofumilast. Remember the side effects, diarrhea is very common. Uh, personally, when I use it, I feel like it's 50-50. Um, when once I get it approved, I feel like 50% of my patients feel better. Yeah. <laughs> so um, so um, I don't know what my colleagues feel about it. I don't use it as much as I used to. Um, but I still it's an option, and some insurances will cover this more than other medications. Yeah. And um, I've seen different things on like different questions I've done. It doesn't they don't necessarily have to be like maxed out on like no. ICS lava. It's based on exacerbations. Right. Yes. Um, and then the flame study. This came out on. Um, I think the week of ATS in 2016. So every time I went to a meeting, they talk about this study. Um, you, all, you all guys know this. So it was studying combination of lava lama versus in, inhaled corticosteroid and lava. And the group that was in lava lama combination, they en ended up having less exacerbation, less moderate er or severe exacerbation, and less severe exacerbation. This was pretty close. But um, this is why we're using more lava lama combinations. So, you review all that, you've done evidence-based, what now? So, COPD or three. So, 51-year-old man with COPD stage three, group D, HIV, uh, normal CD4, lower, low viral load. Um, he's on steroids every other month, basically. Um, he's on um, lava, uh, this is a 
It's a long anti-musk anti and ICS lava combination um, using short acting metagonist as needed, three liters uh, per minute continuously. So you've done everything that we've, we've reviewed. Um, so assuming that this patient, you decide to do rofumilase or acetromycin and that doesn't work, what else can you do? What's that? Good, what else? Okay. You said, so pulmonary rehab is a good option. I don't think it's yet been proven to reduce exacerbation. It does improve performance and quality of life. What else? What about non-medical? You said pulmonary rehab, what else? Other non-medical interventions? Smoking, smoking cessation. Smoking cessation is big. Mm -hmm. What else do you talk with your patients about for prevention? Weight Yeah, so comorbidities, right? So these are some of the things that we talk about. Smoking cessation on everyone, inhaler technique. Again, I think I'm gonna mention it two more times. Um, vaccinations, um, um, if we have saved all our lectures from last year in the, our hard drive. Dr. Kalasi gave a good lecture about it, and specifically for COPD, so uh, for the first years you can review it. Um, <clears throat> and then pulmonary rehabilitation, action plan, as Dr. Perez was saying. So what I'm gonna say about the action plan is, is part of the goal classification. So the action plan meaning it's the same as asthma, we don't talk about it so much in COPD. Um, basically, you tell the patient when you start having more cough, more shortness of breath, here's some steroids here, some antibiotics that you can take. Now, this is my personal opinion about it. I do it with almost all my patients. You have to explain your patients very well when it's appropriate to use it because all, all of you who've rotated with me in clinic know all my patients like to take those prednisone when they have a little bit more cough. Um, so it may not be appropriate when they use it. I usually tell them to call me, um, immediately they start taking it, uh, but an actual plan is pretty good. Um, and then allergies and triggers, and I'm gonna talk about asthma later, but always ask what makes your breathing worse, what triggers your breathing, if it's allergy related, because if you have a good control of this, you may, um, you may prevent some of COPD exacerbations. Um, this is more of what I tell my patients. So hand hygiene is very important for infection control. It's been a bad flu season this year. The CDC said that there was gonna be another wave of flu this, this month. Um, so hand hygiene, not only for the patients, for the physicians or the staff taking care of the patients. Good dental health, I tell my patients, go to the dentist twice a year, please because if they have a lot of <coughs> poor dentition, that can predispose them to infection. Um, and then again, comorbidities, I talk about OSA. Vocal cord dysfunction is still underdiagnosed, I think, here. Um, I've, it's easy to ask a couple questions, patients that have get hoarseness, certain triggers, uh, strong odors, uh, that does not improve with inhalers. <laughs> this is just a quick look by ENT. Um, asthma, very important, assess about asthma specifically asthma overlap um, with COPD. Heart disease, so COPD is an independent risk factor for heart disease, so not only coronary artery disease, but systolic heart failure. And in addition, I have to remember uh, pulmonary hypertension. So all, all COPD patients should at least have one echo um, to assess for that, and associated too with the exercise performance in the six minute walk. So if you have a patient that is not is some good regimen not having a lot of exacerbations and still short of breath and the six minute walk is declining. Think about um, um, RV dysfunction and pulmonary hypertension. So, mucolytic therapy. So this is interesting. So I gathered three opinions about mucolytic therapy. So um, ATS recommends it because it reduces hospitalizations in patients with moderate to severe COPD. Only if it's given in high doses. So 600 milligrams twice a day. Um, Gold says, I, it was interesting, they said may reduce exacerbation. They still put it on their guidelines, but they use this word, which is interesting. ACCP uh, recommends it for moderate to severe ex um, exacerbation uh, on patients that have more than two exacerbations a year. So if you have two exacerbations a year that are being moderate or severe, ACCP recommends it. The UK group, don't mention it a lot, but um, they say that you can use it too for patients with frequent exacerbations. The whole point of the mucolytic therapy is to basically break loose that spin production and basically clear the airways up and also has anti-inflammatory effects. Um, again, I'm gonna talk again about this. So lava, la um, lava, 
And <laughs> this is two different opinions. So when to use one, when to use a combination, when to pick lava over llama. So the uh, European Respiratory Society, they say use uh, the llama therapy reduces the likelihood of uh, moderate to severe exacerbations compared to lava, based on the studies that I showed before. Um, and llama has been associated with fewer side effects. Now, goal stage, they, the recommendation is use a llama or a combination of lava llama for patients that are at risk or have more than two exacerbations a year, or a patient that had one hospitalization from a COPD. They don't talk about monotherapy for lava. Okay. And then, what about <coughs> chronic steroids or quinolones? There's no evidence. Um, I have maybe a handful of patients on chronic steroids. Um, I feel like they have an overlap with asthma, and that's probably why I can't take them off steroids. Um, I don't like having patients on steroids because they develop bone problems and eye problems, the cataracts. So if you do it, <clears throat> you have to be responsible for the bone density test every year, and eye exam, and making sure the sugars are okay, the weight stays in a reasonable <coughs> range. Quinolones, there's studies about quinolones. I left out, um, there's not a lot of evidence to prevent COPD exacerbations. I left out statins. There's also some studies about the statins, but there's not good evidence about it yet. All right. Sorry, I'm going a little fast. I wanted to cover everything. So the COPD year four. So this is a 63 year old woman, FE1 of 65, treated with steroids, and antibiotics almost every month. She's, um, interestingly, she's on room air. She has sleep apnea that's treated, has an A1C that is 12.3. This is her CT. These are the basis of her lungs. So as you can tell, all my cases, so as I'm going, basically, we've done everything that I've discussed so far, and I still have a patient that gets frequent exacerbation. What else is wrong? What am I missing? Okay. She can have like an atypical colonization. And she does. What's that? Atypical colonization. Good. 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 What else? I don't. I'm not going to talk about back, but that's very important. What's that? Yeah. Not necessarily alpha one, but she does have bronchiectasis. This seems to be like it, it gets worse as I'm scrolling down. She ends up having an infiltrate at the lower lobe. What do you think about their A1C? There has got to be a reason why I put it in there. Because it's already pure. Yeah, what else? But also like so if you have uncontrolled diabetes, you're going to have bad heart disease. And then this is what actually I couldn't pick up on. It took me almost a year to pick it up. So she has gastroparesis. Uh, it's her, it's her diabetes has been uncontrolled for so long that she developed gastroparesis. She's being aspirating and that caused bronchiectasis. Um, so that was the problem for, for um, this lady. So <coughs> what the point that I'm trying to make, and she does have some RV dysfunction. Um, the point that I'm trying to make here is, uh, so it's within that this group, because I'm focusing mostly on this here. So the patients that are symptomatic and um, have um, high risk of exacerbation. Is there anything else that we can identify that can, you can treat to prevent COPD exacerbation. So I'm gonna show some studies, some examples, it's not all of them, but I'm gonna show you some. So the first thing is asthma, and this is fairly new. Um, they looked at patients with COPD that had childhood asthma, a childhood pneumonia, or overlap asthma with COPD. <clears throat> they noticed that patients that had either one had increased risk of COPD exacerbations. They had more COPD exacerbations. Um, which is interesting because um, here it is important to know that you have asthma overlap, but this is assuming that they don't have asthma in, as, an, as an adult. This is something that you can pick up quickly on a history. Have you ever had pneumonia when you were growing up? If you have, that you can document that, that this patient has a high risk of exacerbation. The overlap with COPD then that brings another set of um, um, complexities because you have to also focus on the asthma component of the respiratory symptoms. This study showed no association with disease progression. So there was no association with this three on FE1, CT scan changes as far as emphysema, six minute walk, and there were other things that they measured. 
So, cough and sputum, which goes along with what Juan said and the mucolytic therapy. So, um, they looked at the patients that have a lot of cough and sputum, and this kind of makes sense, but um, I mean, it's good to look at it in, um, like in a paper and a statistical analysis from it. Patients with more chronic cough and sputum production, they have more exacerbations in a year, more moderate exacerbations, and more severe exacerbations. So even if you have a patient maybe fitting that old phenotype of chronic bronchitis, maybe that's a patient that's going to get frequent COPD exacerbation. Um, bronchiectasis. So there's several. This is only one study. There's several. If you look on PubMed, I think there was one that was published in CHESS recently, looking at the presence of bronchiectasis with patients with COPD. So the patients with bronchiectasis tended to have more exacerbations and also more uh, the exacerbations tend to lasted longer too. So uh, the importance of this is, I know it makes sense, but if you have a patient with COPD and bronchiectasis, you can treat the bronchiectasis. Airway clearance measures. If you have a CTE that has a report that says bronchiectasis, you should be able to get a patient a vest, a floater valve, those kind of things. Um, I may talk about bronchiectasis in a different day. Um, the treatment for non cf bronchiectasis is a little different than CF bronchiectasis in a couple of aspects. Um, but there are a couple of things that can overlap. To Juan's point about infection, so patients that have lower bacterial colonization um, tended to have more exacerbations than the ones that had lower bacterial colonizations. Um, my first patient, she ended up having pseudomonas. Um, um, I did a sputum culture. I rarely do bronchoscopies. I've done it before for patients with frequent exacerbations that cannot cough up anything. Um, and they have something abnormal in the CT scan. But we don't think of getting a lot of sputum culture. This is easy, you can do it in clinic. Um, and then the most common organisms, this is nonspecific, so they couldn't tell, is Haemophilus influenza, Haemophilus um, par influenza, strep pneumonia, cataralis, and Pseudomonas originosa. So this, in this study, which was a very small study, these are the organisms that they culture. And then you have cell markers. So peripheral eosinophilia, which you can argue that um, it, it's an association with asthma. This was not statistical significance on this graph, but they looked at patients with peripheral eosinophilia of more than 2%, which is this line here. So they had um, um, more um, exacerbations so, uh, than the group that had less than 2% of eosinophilia. And not only that, in this study they proved that the patient that had more eosinophilia and were in the hospital, they were in the hospital longer, and they tended to fail treatment more often than the patient with less than 2%. And then cellular markers, this is a little harder to do, but this is what's published in New England. They looked at what are the different cells in patients with and associated with the different gold class. Again, they talked about gold stage zero. So patients with gold stage four and three, they tended to have more neutrophils, macrophages. Eosinophils were about the same on all four groups. Um, and then if you look at CD4, CD8, um, you can see that there's a lot of CD4 and CD8 um, um, markers on stage four. And then B cells is interesting in stage two and three. So um, this can be useful determining and um, just putting a phenotype on a patient with frequent um, COPD exacerbation and also can lead to ideas for intervention. <coughs> and lastly, so because we don't tend to do this, so Molly, when she was a first year fellow, she came up with this idea that we're still working on. So this is Excel nitric oxide. So measuring Excel nitric oxide as, to, uh, as an association with eosinophil um, in the airways. So um, basically we looked at what is the Excel nitric oxide in patients with more than one exacerbation versus more than two exacerbations a year. The group that, um, this is still preliminary, the group that had one exacerbation had an exhaled nitric oxide of 10.5 versus a group of more than two had an exhaled nitric oxide of 15.2. Now again, this makes you wonder if this group that we're picking up, they also have asthma overlap or something else. Are you following the female serially? Or was just, once, once, just once, okay. just once, just mm. <coughs> once. Right, I'm done. So. Points that I wanted to make, COPD is a costly disease. Outpatient follow-up after they leave the hospital is very important. Again, inhaler technique, 
make sure they use evidence-based. I mean, that, that's very important. There's a lot of data that can guide you what inhalers to use for a specific patient. Um, prevention interventions, not necessarily medical or, um, it, um, or medicines or inhalers that you can use, there are several. Um, and then you should always individualize each treatment within each goal group. I know that the utility of the group class um, is um, important. Um, but every patient can be a little different. If you get a sputum culture to see if they have MAC or any other organism that you can treat leading to um, uh, frequent exacerbation. Sputum cell count, we don't do that here, but that may be a some, somewhere that we can target later in the future. And then um, treat comorbidities, that's very important. So I tried to finish in 45 minutes, and I think I accomplished that. So. I wanted to leave some time for comments from faculty and fellows. Yes. So if you had a patient that came in that has that kind of profile where they have high eosinophils, purple eosinophils, are we supposed to approach them differently in terms of like how we, what we start and how we escalate their COPD care? Like do you look at them? No, I mean it's... The or, is it, or is it just something to tell you like, oh, they're at risk? Right, the difficulty with that is if you have a patient that solely has COPD, and you say, well, maybe has a lot of eosinophils, I should increase the dose of inhaled corticosteroid. That makes it difficult knowing the chance of pneumonias. Um, however, the utility for it, at least on that study that I presented, is that you can tell which patient you have to be a little bit more aggressive um, as far as keeping in the hospital a little longer while you follow them because they tend to have higher um, um, medical tr um, failure. So would those patients maybe consider like the longer taper? Like the right, or not necessarily the longer taper, but maybe, I mean, we always feel the rush of sending patients quickly, quickly, but maybe that's maybe one sign. Now, that graph that I showed was not statistical significant, but, I mean, it's something that you can... You so some years ago when I got here, we, we, we attempted a case management program for COPD focused on employees of the university who would come to our clinics and would get uh, their inhalers free. And the idea was to prevent exacerbations and keep them healthy, that kind of thing. And, and uh, looking through the literature on case management, it's all over the place. There are many models. They tend to work better in Canada than they do here. Um, but, a, but a typical case management program would have a, a, a navigator for about 400 patients that would follow these individuals. It would be their cadre of patients that could call with problems, that kind of thing. And it's all over the place, but it's still very intriguing. You got revamped uh, hours here. Yeah, you have. So yeah, it's, uh, it's different than it used to be. Yeah. So now there's two different, there's mm -hmm. a nurse practitioner and like a, a nurse um, navigator or mm -hmm. coordinator, yeah. and they see them every three months and they see the physician. I think, I don't know if Kavalasi has some, I have maybe a handful, and twice a year and once a year PFTs. Um, so I don't know what's the data about it though. Yeah. So, um, but at least one of the complaints of the patients form, uh, before when I started here was that they didn't know who to contact yeah. when they were getting sick. So, and, and know your Medicaid, your inhalers. I mean, we have in the clinic, we have several pictures that I show the patients. Know what inhaled steroids you're using, what are the doses, if they're medium, low dose, or high dose steroids. That's pretty important. We don't get to talk that much in clinic about that. Um.